Um, I'd like to welcome everyone that's on the streaming as well today, because uh, I understand this is going up beyond this particular room uh, this afternoon. Well, uh, I received a call several months ago um, about uh, responding to Bill McGrath's talk last year about where are all the expert learners. So if you weren't here for that great TED talk, uh, Bill is actually sitting up here in the front because he's, uh, he's my cheerleader over here in the front. And um, so I was given the task to look at how to create expert learners using the stages of personalized learning. So that's really the core of my uh, presentation. But I want to point out to you that we have a back channel. Uh, it's called P Learn Chat, also UDL IRN 16. Uh, I have someone out in uh, Arkansas who's actually going to be tweeting out the entire time. So if you're out there tweeting, just make sure to respond to her or uh, take a look at what she happens to be saying. She has my presentation, so she's, uh, I'm lucky to have a, a partner out in uh, the virtual space today. But anyway, let's take a look at um, what this roadmap is all about today. Um, first of all, we're going to look at the expert learner. Uh, we talk a lot about it, but let's really take closely what CAST has developed and what, of course, we've actually have included in there. Um, we're going to look at discovering the learner using the UDL lens. Uh, I'm a real believer in empowering learners, um, and so I'm going to talk about that today. We're going to look at the stages of personalized learning. Let me just say to you is that uh, in the handouts, there are actually a couple handouts. There are the stages of personalized learning. They're all linked uh, off, of the, off of the conference uh, schedule, uh, as well as a handout that has the links to all of the uh, information that I'm going to be talking about today. So there's a three-page handout there, too. Uh, and then we're going to look at the expert learner through the stages of personalized learning. And um, that will be uh, a new view, because we really see that learners really develop over time. And um, no one comes in being a, a child that can experience a learner-centered environment. It really is a process. So my psychology behind all of this is, geez, how do we get teachers to do all of this and truly understand how to teach all learners using this UDL lens? So who are the expert learners? And this is really the, uh, the headings from CAS, where they talk about resourceful and knowledgeable learners. They talk about purposeful and motivated learners and strategic and goal-oriented learners. And these are the expert learners. But what are the qualities under each one of these? So let's take a close look at the expert learner and what we really anticipate we want them to be. So expert learners are resourceful and knowledgeable because they're able to of course, activate prior knowledge and make connections to prior learning, to be able to organize their, their learning and their knowledge. They're able to use all kinds of different types of learning strategies to access information. They're highly skilled in using tools. Um, they know how to choose the tools uh, to help them out, resources. They know how to use them for very, spe very specific tasks or a combination of tools. They know how to integrate tools very well, and they know how to transfer new information into usable knowledge. Uh, if that isn't the task that we want all kids to have, I mean, that's really the skill that we definitely want kids to have. But let's take a look at an expert learner that's motivated and engaged. Uh, this whole idea of a purpose and learning. So um, think about the learners in your classroom. Can you say that? Can you say and look around and just saying, boy, that, that child has a purpose in their learning. Um, and that's probably pretty important because that really provides that engagement. Um, they, um, they learn by the mastery of learning itself. These kids have an absolute love for learning. Um, and, and they are always seeking out new learning. We talk a lot about kids that actually what's called hack education. They go out and they find new information. They're going out and seeking new information and new knowledge, and new learning on their own. Okay. They know how to set goals to push their learning. They really want to extend themselves. When we can't say that every child that we know has that ability, in fact, we probably don't have, and the big question last year what Bill was talking about is where are all the expert learners? These are the learners that we want. So, um, but they know how to sustain effort. They're, they have a lot of perseverance, a lot of grit, so uh, to really reach their goals. Um, 
So let's look at how they, how they work strategically towards their goals. Uh, first of all, they know how they learn best. They know who they are and who they are as a learner. Uh, that's really critically important to becoming an expert learner. They know how to develop personal learning plans. They know how to set goals and action plans around their goals. They know how to develop very effective strategies. They're able to monitor their progress at any time in their learning, no matter where it is. And they know how to adjust their learning, okay, when learning's not effective at all. So some of this information, by the way, came out from CAST, and they're brand new. I'm seeing David uh, Gordon back there. Hi, Aria. So uh, they came up with some really good information. We've added a few more items on there. So, um, but we really think that um, this is really explains what an expert learner is. And how many people are familiar with expert learner, the term expert learner? Maybe I should just have you raise. Okay. So, here's what Bill, uh, I wanna tell you that I was so taken by Bill's talk last year too, that I asked him to do a blog post for us because he really hit the nail on the head and he actually did a great job in doing a blog post and I have a link on the handout to his, his post. Uh, but here's what he says the framework is, uh, as guidelines to build expert learners. Learners who can navigate flexible learning opportunities with great skills, okay? And learners who do not just navigate, but are active partners and innovators in the design of learning, of future learning. So, um, so you know, who's the teacher and who's the learner in all of this, right? You have to think about that. And so, I've been looking at the UDL framework for well over 15 years, okay? And so I said, you know, um, I'm one that needs sort of like to have labels, I need to look at a process, I need to think about it as a process. So I looked at, um, uh, by the way, we've, we've changed the terms around the, um, uh, around the principles to access, engage, and express, um, and I'll tell you why in, in a few minutes. But this is truly what I saw. In that very first level, okay, under those guidelines, we're really talking about giving accessibility for the variability in learning. Uh, and so getting that on the table and getting people to understand that piece is very important. That means all classroom teachers. Then the next stage in this progression is where there's guided practice with the development of skills and strategies that would support their learning. Okay, and then as they're moving towards expert learner in that next area, it's around independent and self-directed practice. Um, so those are just general headings that I needed to have for myself, and so I'm just gonna share those out with you, and that's how I see it. So I wanna pr present that in this way to see if that makes really sense to you about the guidelines, about where they're going to the expert learner. So uh, how do we develop the expert learner. Well, this will be a, diff a different perspective, I think, than other people have. Um, so, I work around the area of personalized learning, and New Deal is, is the lens, it's also the framework around lesson design. So, one thing that's extremely important around personalized learning, using UDL, whatever, is you have to discover the learner in every child. Uh, our big problem today, and I realized this over the last 30 plus years that I've been in education, is that we've created tons of labels for children and that teachers have developed certain perceptions of these children and what they're capable of. That's a big hurdle in public education. And when Carrie was talking about developing a belief system, that's why that is so important. Because the thing is, you actually have to believe that every child's a learner. If you don't do that, you can't really make that change. So um, this is sort of built right into my heart, by the way. So, but um, we need to focus really on learners and how they learn best, okay? The other thing we need to do is to empower the learner with this information. We need for them to look at themselves as learners through that lens as well. We've sort of kept that a big dark secret for most kids. If you ask a kid today, you know, uh, how do you learn best, they wouldn't ha no, have any idea how to answer you on the most part. We actually need to have those conversations about 
over a decade ago, I was working with uh, teams uh, of classroom teachers along with special ed teachers. And one of the things that I kept on hearing from the classroom teachers is about the kids with disabilities. And uh, so I said, okay, stop. And uh, I actually came up with this phrase. So I said, you know, if you just remove the veil of disability, you're going to see the learner. And um, not to think that I was going to come back to this all over again. It's always been on my mind that we don't ever focus on the learners. We don't talk about learning. They don't talk about their learning necessarily. And they don't know who they are as a learner. And they're probably not, you know, and being valued as a learner is important. So we basically use the UDL lens of access, engage, and express. And these are just the ways that we've interpreted access, engage, and express. Uh, I have to thank uh, Patty Rollabate a long time ago when we had this conversation. Uh, so, um, and she's always on my mind when I'm doing this, really, <laughs> I have to tell you. So, we use access, engage, and express because I discovered that the principals had too much language. It couldn't really get translated into practice, okay? Uh, I, kids, teachers really struggled with it. They really didn't understand that. So four years ago, I had an epiphany at like at 4 a.m. in the morning. And I said, you know what? It's three words. We've got to break it down to three words because we want it to, it to be really in a teacher's thoughts every minute of the day. You have to break it down into, into smaller chunks, okay? So I wanted, I'm always thinking of practitioners and how practitioners are going to use this. So we use this, and let me just tell you, now this actually, we've used this in a lot of different school districts, and, um, and teachers talk about access, engage, and express, but guess what? So do the kids. Now the kids talk about who they are as learners through those terms. Okay, and so let me just introduce you to um, the process that I will tell you that I sort of developed over a, over a period of time because I wanted to empower the kids. So, first of all, it's the personal learner profile. Personal learner profile is really looking at strengths and challenges, preferences and needs, okay, along with their interests and talents through the lens of access, engage, and express. And this is just really important because kids need to talk about who they are as learners in any way that they can. Sometimes th they may need support from an adult, but this personal learner profile is for the kids, for the kids to use, to start talking about who they are. The next one is once you understand all of those pieces, then you can actually have a conversation about the tools, the apps, the resources, about the learning skills that they need to develop, not just around challenges but also around strengths okay and we want them to develop learning skills for a lifetime okay and so that's one of the big pieces here now that personal learner profile by the way becomes the conversation piece between teacher and learner and one of the very important things around personalized learning is that it's important to build relationships that's absolutely key you have to understand who learners are but actually have conversations with them. We've actually had teachers use this personal learner profile out in the field, and here's what the kids say, okay? They basically say that you cared enough to ask me who I am as a learner. That's the message we tell children when we give them this opportunity to talk about how they learn, because lots of children feel very bad about how they learn, okay? And the last thing is a personal learning plan. This is all around goal setting. This is goal setting and action steps in around learning goals. And some kids may not have every goal here, okay? Some kids may need to have a goal around access and not around it engage or whatever, but these goals are really around developing learning skills. The other types of goals we've listed here are personal goals, college, career, and citizenship goals because we want kids to know that they need to develop goals around citizenship, that they are really a part of a greater community in a global world, and that they can contribute to that. And we really need to help kids on this set goals around that as well. So I'm just gonna bring you through just sort of like the process here. 
So it's like a three-step process, okay? So first, you have every learner tell their story, who they are, and how they learn using a personal learner profile. They, we, actually have a, and we actually have a new publication that's gonna be coming out in the fall, and this personal learner profile is part of the set of tools that are gonna be part of that publication, but we're also gonna have a companion website that's gonna have those documents as well for you to use. Um, so we want kids to share out their strengths and challenges around Access, Engage, and Express because they need to know and they need to take ownership too around their learning. We're really big around that ownership and responsibility around learning because right now the teachers are 100% responsible and accountable for everyone's learning. Every kid needs to be responsible for that learning. Um, so. Let's take a look about what that would look like. So some of the things that we want to know too is how they describe themselves. Words about me, okay? What are my interests? What are my talents? What, I'm, what am I passionate about? What do I love to do as a kid? You know, and this could, it's gonna be a different story for every child. And what are their aspirations? We want to know what that is as early as possible, okay? And then this here just gives you sort of a glimpse of one child here. So this is a child that has challenges in reading, but actually has some excellent skills around uh, expression. Okay, this is something that we would, have, we would want to know. And this is really for every kid, not just for a select number of children, but all children. Then in the second step, by the way, we want them to develop a personal learning backpack to support their learning. So that's where your conversation begins. You know, you have that conversation. Yes? Can I ask a question about the previous slide where it says, I cannot decode. Like, is, is it because of where they are in the um, learner profile, or would it be better for a kid to know, I, I have difficulty, or I cannot decode words or understand what I read yet? Like yet, 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 right, yet. That's a good point, actually. Uh, that's a Carol Dweck uh, approach, is saying yet at the end, right? So, uh, really good point. Um, so, some kids would be able to say that. Um, the thing is, most children who struggle with reading never say these words. Um, and uh, the whole idea is that we really want to have that conversation so that, because if they never talk about it, it's just never validated that's who they are. Um, and it's really our job, of course, to help every child become a learner, uh, to be able to take those challenges that they happen to have. And this does not all solve with tools or anything like that, and, and I, I understand that, but the thing is, and there's a lot of direct instruction around kids that have major challenges in reading. So, uh, my oldest son was a severe dyslexic, so I have first-hand knowledge to that. Um, but anyway, um, this is just sort of a glimpse about what that could look like, okay? Um, the profile, by the way, is a, is, a major, is a checklist of items and it's ways for kids to really look at that and reflect on that too. So I'm showing you just a real glimpse uh, of what this is going to look like. Um, but anyway, it really can begin the conversation, okay? And then you can start talking about um, really about what their preferences and needs are, what they would... Uh, what they may understand would be a good tool, but this is where you could actually introduce a lot of good resources or good, or good uh, tools or, or, or apps or whatever that happens to be. And, um, and this could be a lot, this is gonna be all around developing an action plan in a few minutes, but here's what that backpack could look like for that learner, okay? All right, so under access um, and because we're familiar with, and by the way, children are, lots of children are familiar with lots of these tools too. And so they may make the suggestion, but this is that conversation that you really need to have with them on really how they're going to develop, what type of skills that they need to have, if they know how to use those tools, they need to use a resource, and really what, um, what they're gonna need to do as far as developing those skills. So the third is really when you're really talking with them and you're consulting with them to set goals and action plans. Um, I know this seems like, and by the way, lots of ways to do this, by the way, is really at the beginning of the year. 
when you do this. Um, this is a really good time to do it. And you don't have to set like five or six goals, but let me just tell you, so what you're dis uh, deciding on around the learning goals. Really, what type of skills uh, do we need to develop for you to be able to be able to use that tool, that resource, uh, or a strategy, um, and then look at personal college career and citizenship goals, and also the action steps that they're going to have to do to reach that particular goal. Uh, goal setting um, is something that we don't do a lot of in, in schools with kids, setting goals and, and coming up with some sort of steps to get there because it, and it's great training for kids as they go on into adulthood to be able to set goals and action steps with kids. But then decide how you're going to meet that goal. What is it going to be that you're going to be able to do in the end? Okay, so, so now they're talking a lot deeper about who they are and how they can a and actually have some confidence that they can actually get there. Okay, uh, you also want to talk about other supports they may need. Um, in, in this whole, uh, in developing actions. So when you see the next slide, it's not the complete uh, set of uh, an action plan, but this is sort of what it would look like. Um, there's other elements here, including a reflection piece. Uh, it talks about the different types of tools that could certainly be there. It could talk about what the resources you may need to actually achieve that goal. Um, but this is that, that great s setting plans um, an action plan around goals and then achieving those. So, um, more about that when we, um, as I said, we have a, I, there's only so much I can put in my slides today because I have a publication coming out in, in the fall and you, you're kind of bound by how much you can release into, uh, into the public <laughs> before it actually gets published. But I thought this was just the perfect place to really share all of this. So here's what I, I look at. So if you take the profile and the backpack and develop a great plan with kids, okay, then kids can actually acquire skills. And the problem about becoming an expert learner is that they're not acquiring the skills that they need, okay, to get there. Um, and they need to know how to select tools, resources on their preferences and needs. They need to develop strategies and skills because those are the things that, sh that you have for a lifetime. You know, and then we always want kids really to reflect on the evidence of their learning and really how they demonstrated that they've acquired those skills. They have to tell themselves and show themselves. We want kids to be able, to, and the whole set of skills that I know this is a one-liner about self-directing and monitoring their learning, I will tell you that's probably the toughest skill. That's something that you actually have to teach kids on how to monitor their learning and um, how to get feedback. Uh, from teachers, from peers, and how you use all of that. So this is an important piece, but that's a skill in itself that learners need to have. So we're finally gonna get to the stages, and I do wanna tell you that one of your handouts is the stages. Uh, we recently revised it. Um, so let me just say that we had teachers coming up to us and emailing us and saying, our superintendent wants us to create learner centered environments in the next school year. And it, it would be like, really? <laughs> they want them to go from a traditional classroom to a learner centered environment because they think it was that easy to do. Okay. So this is just to show that there's a process. And that's why we developed the stages of personalized learning, just to show you those. Okay, as I said, you actually have a copy of this online for yourself. And you can't see this actually too well, but so let me give you an idea what this all says. Um, in stage one, this is where, by the way, the teacher really understands how learners learn um, and by talking with the learner around their profile. And they're able to more universally design their instruction um, and have learners set goals around their plan in that stage one. This is also where they're giving learners voice and choice in their learning. We always say that's really the really very first step is knowing how to give voice and choice. And I'm gonna show you a continuum very shortly about voice and choice um, because it's different at every stage. Um, but in stage two, this is by the way where the learner and teachers really are the co-designers of, of lessons and learning environments. Um, they also, are able to monitor, begin monitoring their progress, 
They show mastery of learning through standards. They are totally responsible for uh, meeting targets and, and the way that they want to meet them. They have that choice in how they want to meet targets. Um, and they're able to articulate that. And um, they also have opportunities, extended learning opportunities. Um, in, there's a lot of schools in the New England area, I'm from New Hampshire, that we have a thing in New Hampshire called extended learning opportunities and kids get that opportunity to choose to be involved in some sort of um, learning experience outside of the classroom. And so there is um, actually coordinators in all the high schools in New Hampshire, extended learning opportunity. Uh, so that actually starts like in middle school and so kids get those experiences and things that they like to do, they get to try those things out and they get to have a mentor. Uh, in stage three, that's really where it's learner driven. Uh, this is where kids are designing their own projects. Uh, the teacher is basically a facilitator and guide uh, in this particular stage and they become more of an expert learner by the way at this particular stage. Uh, they design their own assessment strategies. They um, they obviously always work at their own pace. They're working a lot outside of the classroom and working with community or global members. So, but they're always looking at really where they're experiencing and trying out things that really fulfill their, their passions or aspirations. So their extended learning opportunities are pretty robust at this particular stage. So this just gives a complete overview so that you can see that um, that stage one is when you really start using that UDL lens um, and they, you're supporting them in creating profiles. You're redesigning your learning environment really to support all different types of learners because now that you know who your learners are, you're really creating a more robust environment, a flexible environment for kids to learn in. Uh, that, by the way, I just saw some data around that, that uh, classroom redesign is one of the biggest things in education this year. All over the country, something like 80% of classrooms are, re are getting redesigned. Uh, so this is, uh, there's all sorts of new furniture and new ways to, to place kids. Um, universally designing instruction, I'm not going to get into that, but you know, there definitely is a way to understand how to universally design based upon who the learners are to get a cross section. And boy, that is really the first step. And this is, uh, and what it is is, these are just baby steps really in this, in this very first stage. This is where kids are very proactive learners in that learner-centered environment. They monitor their progress. They, they you know, co-design the rubrics around lessons and projects. Uh, they are the questioners in lessons. Um, they contribute to the design, of course, of all types of assessment strategies. We actually have some several examples. Um, Maine was, is, has some really, if you go to the, um, the DOE Maine site, there's some excellent video about how kids have basically do design all the rubrics in all the lessons that they're doing. Um, and then this in stage three is basically, uh, this is where kids know how to monitor and adjust their, their profile. They know how to update all their goals, develop their action plans. They do, they're the ones that design all the learning challenges that they have. Um, we have, there's some actually models uh, in New Hampshire and there's quite a few in New England uh, around this very uh, learner driven environments. There's quite a few models um, in the New England area that we have. But um, this is where kids are, are totally self-directing uh, their learning and um, it's a great, it's a great view. Uh, our local high school um, by the way, actually has that sort of environment. So I, my, my youngest son had that experience where he was all entirely self-directed in his learning through high school. But they truly understand who, who they were as learners and how to learn. And so um, that was a um, really important uh, experience for him. So now I'm gonna get some, some interesting concepts about the elements of learner agency and um, really how it all sort of fits in. So developing expert learners really provides the, the journey learners of all ages can go through to develop agency. Uh, several months ago, um, we did a six part block series on learner agency and this happens to be one of the hottest topics in education uh, on learner agency. So 
here are the elements that we see. And um, we're actually diving quite deep in the book around learner agency. And an entire chapter is on this. So I'm going to have some questions for you because I'm getting tired of talking. <laughs> I don't usually talk for this long. <laughs> and, um, and let's take a look at, we're going to look at voice choice and engagement. And then we're going to look at the continuums in each one of those, okay? Because we need to be thinking about what this looks like. Uh, what does voice look like? So this is the first one. Okay, so I want to say we have to thank Sylvia Duckworth from taking our ideas and creating a visual around this very particular thing. Uh, I actually have, um, there's links to our website that have all these graphics, by the way. We have all these graphics online, um, and that will be. Um, so here's my question. So take a look at Teacher Centered, okay? So at the very beginning, this Teacher Centered, and let's see if you agree or disagree, because this is always, it's always, I like to get some feedback on this, is that at the beginning, the kids are really in this area of expression and consultation. They're answering questions, they're giving opinions about things. Um, they provide some input and some feedback, okay? And they share their personal learner profile at this point, okay? And they also, they take surveys. So this is still teacher-centered. So this is around voice. This is maybe what it looked like at that point because what we were kept at, we were always asked is, what does it look like in each, in each level? So, um, I have a question for you. So, and then the next stage, it's around learner center. And this is where kids are participating more actively. They're being far more proactive learners around decision making. They're able to articulate action steps. They collaborate with teachers and learners. Uh, they are able to contribute to the design of lessons and projects, okay? And then this very last stage, this is really where the activism occurs. So, these are where kids are identifying problems. They're becoming active members of their community. Um, they're advocates for change, okay? And I'm sure that you probably already know these types of kids that you've already had in your schools or whatever. And then the very last is where kids are actually leading a cause, okay? And this is where their voice is heard, okay? And um, this is where they, uh, we, I've actually seen this in action. Um, I go to a conference called the High School Redesign Conference and and I've seen kids who have brought legislation, uh, you know, to the house uh, in Rhode Island where they got changes made. Uh, but they were very deliberate and there was such, such leadership among, among those students, uh, for sure. So, uh, I want to pause here for just a minute and ask you, where in this, in this continuum do you see your learners? Where do you see your learners in this continuum? This is not a test. So talk, talk to each other first. Go ahead and talk to each other and talk about what, what you've seen in the classroom. What have you seen in the classroom? Is this, is, is this what you see? And what else would you add here? Let me give you a few minutes. What do you see? What are you observing? It's on the schedule. Um, if you go on the schedule, yes. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. yeah, that's where it is. Okay. Anyone else? Who wants to? Uh, who wants to talk about uh, their learners? Kathleen, you have a. Uh, what's that? Somehow I knew. Where 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 are your learners? She was saying. Where 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 are your where are your learners on this continuum? Well, she probably has more. No. I'll I'll say it. We. Okay. Tell me where your learners are. We were talking that we we feel like a lot of our learners are living in between the teacher centered and learner centered in any given part of the day, and they visit the learner driven when it's really well planned like we have two grade levels at our school that are doing project-based learning Louie <laughs> uh, which she helped us design right, right. and because of that they, they're more in the activism and leadership part okay. but they're not going to stay there they're you know and for I mean they're they're just not it's it's they're going to kind of go back to more of the learner centered but I feel like you could go into any of our classrooms throughout the day and you're going to kind of see, see them all of back and forth between and and we were all kind of agreeing that that yeah. we live throughout the continuum right. throughout the day so you know when you get to so you're really experiencing expert learners when you when you're getting to the that the the end mm -hmm. of that um, that spect continuum so when we are talking about what does it look like through the stages i'm just showing this through the stages because that's what i was asked to do uh, but I think we do see a, 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 all of this. We see yeah. elements of all of this during the course of the day. And we p need to start recognizing when kids are exhibiting expert learning. Right. Right? And we kind of have to let them know, right? <laughs> Would you like to? Sure. Sure, okay. Um, I was thinking that when I map, if I were to map out the the learning process in my classroom or when I do I could probably pinpoint some areas where by that point in time my students are at the like activism and leadership um, points in the curriculum mm -hmm. and then as we start to as as their understanding of a particular concept or skill grows they develop more of those leadership skills so oftentimes at the beginning of a unit or skill mm. they start out consulting with me um, expressing some students who feel strongly like or feel like they're really good at that skill accomplished might develop partnership or activism from the start but oftentimes it has to do with their their understanding of a concept as right. well right wow this is this, this is really great news I have to say okay so over here so Bill what do you think what are you, what are you guys talking about over here I, well, I, I think sharing well. your perspective on <laughs> okay. internationally. Um, well, I support um, 39 countries, so I'm seeing how, um, how context matters very much here. So for example, in, in China, I think there would be a block like missing, like left from expression. Yes, and that yes, would be the right, expectations right. of students, and that's the context well, the, of the well, system. The traditional classroom yeah. is before all of this. Even, right? Yeah, <laughs> even there. Yeah. Um, and for example, in India, um, they really seek, like, one of their goals is to, to develop student leadership. So in the classrooms, you see students, like, leading change, and not only in the classroom, but in community, and that's their goal. Right, right. And in New Zealand, um, because they have a very interesting concept of um, of learning that they call ACO, that learning is not one direction, but it's two directional, bi directional, if you say yeah, that. Nice, um, yeah, yeah. Where the teacher is also seen as a learner just as a student. So I think partnership is, is like their goal because that's how their culture sees it. Right. So right. Wow, yeah, that, that, that's really a good perspective that it really looks different everywhere. And it actually, some of it may not even, it may even exist on this particular continuum. We do know that there's a traditional yeah. over to the left side. Okay. Um, so, Bill. Well, I, w I was just thinking. So, where are the expert learners, Bill? Have you seen <laughs> well, them lately? Well, as I, w I was looking <laughs> at this, it, it made me realize, uh, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm looking at where I operate and trying to move teachers, and it feels really meager. When I, when I look at that, because it really is just, you know, shifting towards that break of teacher-centered to learner-centered. Um, but the other thing that, that came to mind from the discussion is, you know, I think one, one of the 
the things that's implied with like the stages and everything else is this is this is based on patterns right it's patterns. based on routines it's based on right. developing habits right and you know like you, you can't do like you know a project-based learning thing every you know every quarter or every unit and and get to this it really like you know you're all these things about culture and all the other things you're talking about it, it requires patterns and habits and and we're certainly not there but I, it, this has helped me kind of well, that, that's a really good that. perspective that it's around patterns and habits and uh, it's also around behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I always looked at in, in order to, for teachers to grow and progress, you know, their behavioral, their, uh, their practices are behavioral. So you have, how do you move them? Um, because instruction is very behavioral and that's really of the challenges I think we have uh, in, in creating the change uh, in classrooms. Anyone over here? What do you see? Anyone? Um, so I, w I was dominated the conversation. I'm really sorry, but I um, met a teacher in our county and he was so passionate and it was just absolutely amazing the activism and leadership that he was guiding within his students in the classroom. And um, he was teaching, uh, teaching an elective and I was telling them that um, we have state numbers that are um, assigned to certain courses and so we're trying to get around that um, piece of it because it would be an amazing humanity slash English course. But the kids come in and he gives them standards and he um, gives them all these choices and they have to, they have kind of like an idea fair and they submit proposals for whatever um, element of change that they want to make occur. And then whoever wins, wins those particular standards. Well, then the other ones have to apply for the standards in which they are um, trying to master. And um, they have to do proposals and they have to actually make it occur. And he's taking um, a group of these students to Guatemala to actually do a service project that they uh -huh. had themselves uh -huh. created. Uh -huh. I mean, uh -huh. it was just absolutely amazing. Uh -huh. so. Right. Thanks. You want to, no? Well, one of the experiences that I had. Um, a couple a uh, couple years ago was to go up to Vermont uh, to Mount Abraham um, Union Middle High School where they have what's called a Pathways to Graduation program and this is where kids really are designing their own pathways uh, designing their own experiences all are aligned by the way to standards and competencies that they have to meet but the kids experiences are just absolutely phenomenal um, I bet kids at 16 years old, they're running their own business. This is what they wanted to do. They know where they wanted to go. They were being mentored by people that could help them get there. And they really saw the value uh, and they had purpose in their learning uh, at that point. And um, that's a very small school, by the way, in the very northern Vermont regions, but they've had this Pathways program for a decade. They're actually considered one of the national models about uh, what you're exactly you're talking about is is that kids are really having those experiences where they're following their passions and their interests uh, early on in high school and then they're designing their own uh, pathways and learning experiences uh, along with by the way some very skilled people in personalized learning uh, guided by the work of um, John Clark who was with Brown University who consulted on the pathways program for a decade so um, the kids it's, it's a total wow. Uh, I can't begin to tell you in this little teeny town in northern Vermont what they've done. Uh, now they're introducing this down at the middle school level where kids can design their, what, what we call in New Hampshire by the way is extended learning opportunities and, um, and they're getting those experiences. And so they are arriving all the way to that activism and leadership. They, they are developing their own businesses and um, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> so I suppose I ought to. So this kind of gives you just an overview. This is just another representation of what this <laughs> looks like uh, through the stages. And this sort of just gives you that glimpse um, of what that could look like. Now we're going to look at another continuum of choice. And this is the big piece. Um, and. Um, going from and by the way if you actually want to get to that website there's a bitly at the bottom 
of these charts so you can go there. Um, so this is where kids go from uh, participant, um, where they're just, they're provided a menu of options by the teacher, okay? Uh, and this actually happens, and, and probably this is a good thing, but they're given really choices around access, engage, and express. This teacher really is prepared to support the learners in the classroom at, that, at this particular stage because she knows who they are and how they learn. And um, then as it moves towards this more learner-centered where they're co-designers and designers, this teacher still at the beginning is still providing options, um, and, but they, she's actually getting input from learners in the process, whether it's designing lessons or the choices that they're gonna have in their projects or, or whatever, but this is when the kids start contributing to that. And the next stage is around designing um, based on very specific questions. This gets, of course, into project-based learning and going deeper into the questioning uh, where the kids are developing the questions and all the ideas around designing. And then um, the next one is around advocate, okay? And this is really falls in line with the voice, okay, where kids become an advocate uh, around an issue, uh, around um, developing action, around advocacy. Uh, I happen, another part of my life, I'm actually um, an advocate for legislation, uh, educational legislation, so that's another part of my life. But I really love the idea of advocacy. Um, then entrepreneur, like I said to you, um, this is where kids are really, are at that level of expert learner, okay? They, they're not only designing their own learning paths, but they're designing their own learning all the time. And, um, and now they're actually, again, creating businesses. Um, I will tell you how thrilling it is to talk with someone 15 and 16 years old who knows where they're going and what they're going to do and what they want to do and what they're passionate about and get to do. So my question to you, do you see any of your learners, I'd like you to talk just for a few minutes. I have about 12 or 13 minutes left of the presentation, but I'd like you to talk about what you see around choice in your classrooms. And I'll be around. Do you see the expert learner? <laughs> Okay. Okay, who'd like to talk back here? Anyone? So, what's that? Yep. Uh, they're all there. They're, they're all there. There. Uh, there are the black posts. Yeah, yeah. So if you do, if you just look for a continuum of choice, a continuum of voice, just put continuum, and it'll come up with all the continuums in the search. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. Oops. No, really, it's not like it. Yeah. No, it's it's too many mics. Too many mics. Yeah. 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 I can hold it for you. Thank you. They're, they're trying to stream all this. What's that? We're live streaming it very Yeah. Oh, it does. Actually, I'm actually not an expert. I'm a PhD student doing my duty. <laughs> So where do you, uh, anybody want to share out right now where you see your learners in this uh, continuum? Does anyone, does anyone want to share out? Or are you seeing, um, where are your kids in the, in the area of, of, of choice? Okay. She's got the mic. She took it away from me. <laughs> So hey everybody, oh, um, I typically work with, because I, I am a teacher. So uh, I work uh, mostly with new teachers in urban settings, typically, right now I'm in Chicago Public Schools, and most new teachers aren't willing to really take the risk that is necessary to allow their children to have choice. They. Like they have to 
they didn't have to have the control that most of the time isn't there either. But, um, <laughs> and they don't feel safe enough even with administrators. You know, so it's like this double edge. They're nervous themselves, and then they're also nervous to give up that control because their administrators might be critical of them. Yeah, so Patty. So one of the things that we were talking about here is that um, many of the teachers, <laughs> we have to stay a certain distance. <laughs> Uh, many of the teachers that uh, I work with um, are pretty novice teachers to begin with. And so they really are reluctant to give up that control, but also they don't understand basic lesson planning right. in a way that, that they make the goal relevant to the students, personally relevant to right. the students, right. what they're teaching. They don't want to give up that control. They also don't um, sometimes they don't even tell them what the goal of the lesson is in a way that the students can actually articulate right. it themselves. Right, you know? right. So they, they would need right. I'll see you later. a lot of right. help you. You help to get to a lot of support, a lot of scaffolding to get to this point. Well, I kind of like would love to have Carrie here because she was talking about what it really takes to make all this sort of happen because um, you really got to have everyone on board. There's from the top down, the bottom up, everyone in between, parents, kids, all sort of need to understand what this means and really what, how you're going to be operating. So like she showed lots of great examples of how they give kids choice uh, in especially around their reading and things that they're going to do or how they're going to express what they know or that sort of stuff. So how do you apply UDL, um, you know, um, uh, framework with new teachers? I mean, I think our biggest challenges in schools today is that we're not training pre-service teachers in this stuff. And um, they're going to enter a world, by the way, that's going to get very different very fast, okay? Uh, this new legislation is going to open up lots of opportunities to really change what we do. Uh, I live in New Hampshire. I live in a competency-based world, ha and and that's just who we are in New Hampshire. But so is Maine. Thirty states, by the way, are moving to competency-based, and taken and grades will go away. I will tell you in the next decade. I would say performance-based diplomas are going to dominate what kids are given, not based on grades. Okay, Maine, by the way, 2018 performance-based diplomas. Will higher ed accept those? Absolutely. They have, they have already bought in. 60 universities and colleges just in New England alone have agreed to performance-based diplomas. So as the country goes, because the reauthorization recently just really opened the door for that for states to move in that direction. So all this stuff around voice and choice and creating learner-centered environments and kids meeting competencies and and mastering competencies. This is where it's all going. Um, I live in that world all the time. I read about it all the time. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to a conference the next two days. It's entirely competency-based, entirely. Every model that I will see it will be at a competency-based level. It's called the High School Redesign Conference if anyone has the desire to go and see those models. But a lot of these models have been around for a long, long time. Okay, so this is nothing new, by the way. This is Definitely not something new, but I think it's due to our thinking for a lot of people. So let me just finish up. Uh, so that's what it looks like uh, across uh, the stages, um, what learner choice could look like. Uh, we just put this out, by the way, called the Continuum of Engagement. Um, Barbara Bray and I, um, who are co-founders of Personalized Learning, um, we, a we actually see things on, uh, on these continuums. And this is actually quite wordy, um, but this actually tells you where engagement begins, you know, where kids are. And I actually heard this word today, by the way, compliant. Um, um, but at this particular stage, kids are really not talking about their learning. And I want to tell you a little bit about this whole thing around engagement. So um, we actually have done a lot of reading around a researcher called Chris Watkins, 
who's a researcher at the University of London. And he's been doing research on learning for 25 years. Um, he has really um, becomes the sort of a, almost like a mentor. Um, four years ago when we put out the stages, uh, he actually sent us an email and said, I've been trying to say this for 20 years, which you guys just put in the chart. So, um, but anyway, definitely look him up. Uh, he talks a lot about kids. He talks about meta-learning and kids talking about the learning. Not metacognition, but meta-learning. Okay, this is a really important point. That if, in order to get this engagement changed, you kids have to start talking about their learning and making connections to their learning. They need to build relationships with kids. They need to be, um, take more responsibility for their learning and actually in the second level, this commit, that's what happens. And then connect is when they really apply inquiry to discovery, okay? This is where kids really are starting connecting with other kids, kids around the world. They teach each other. Uh, they, they are in control and have more ownership to their learning. And flow, we love the word flow, but that's really a theory. Um, and uh, flow is when the kids are really, you know, following their uh, passion um, to find their purpose. And that's really at the, at the very end. So any comments about engagement? I don't have a lot of time, but, um, but this is fairly new. Um, we're actually doing continuums on all the elements. Um, so over the, next, over the next several months, you'll see these continuums. And if you want to sort of follow us, we're on P-Learn Chat. Anything that we're putting out will actually come out on P-Learn Chat. Um, and this here is, we're going to do one on ownership, purpose, and self-efficacy. But this is all about creating learner agency and developing the expert learner. So um, I think that a lot of you should have shared today uh, that you actually have, you notice expert learning in your classrooms that you've actually seen that and you uh, recognize that. So anyway, let me just get to the end here. So here's just the overview of the learner engagement across the stages. And, um, and here's just really what's called the crosswalk. Uh, so Barbara and I are big at looking and, and showing things in different ways <laughs> so that there's conceptualization around our ideas. And, um, and we're really big on, on tables for sure and um, we don't have the skills really to do those graphics but Sylvia Duckworth is the person we have to thank for doing all of those and you'll see a lot of her sketch notes out there by the way but this is sort of just gives you that overview of just voice choice and engagement at the expert learner through the stages so here's what we really really believe um, we need to really discover the learner right using that UDL lens but the learner has to discover who they are as learners first, okay? I know that's a, a big change up. It's not, it's really about empowering learners, truly. It's, and when you actually empower learners with skills and strategies and knowing how they learn, they can talk about their learning, that's truly when you can develop expert learners, okay? They have voice, choice, and are engaged. So anyway, um, I talked about Barbara, but I'll, just give you a sort of a view. This is Barbara, and um, she's my partner in crime. Um, we actually have, by the way, want to share this out, a P-Learn chat every other week. It is extremely popular. There's virtually a number of people from all over the world that get involved in our discussions. Jackie Gerstein, does anyone know Jackie Gerstein? She is phenomenal. She talks about UDL all of the time. Uh, she's going to do a thing on the educator with a maker mindset. She's on for one hour. We put up the questions in advance. Uh, if you follow us uh, on, on, um, on Twitter, you'll see all of that. But that's really, really uh, lots of fun, by the way. It's one hour of the best PD that you'll ever have, <laughs> let me tell you. So um, we have a book, Make Learning Personal. I like to give away a copy. I brought one today. I don't want to bring it back home. Um, so if you put your name out on this table here, I'll just draw your name. and and I'll give away the book. Um, we have a new book coming out in the fall called How to Personalize Learning, a Practical Guide for Getting Started and Going Deeper. And um, I thank everyone for a great day.